This is week six, recovering a sense of abundance. I'm a believer, Nancy says. I just don't believe that God gets involved with money. For many of us, raised to believe that money is the real source of security, a dependence on God feels foolhardy, suicidal, even laughable. When we consider the lilies of the field, we think they're quaint and too out of it for the modern world. We're the ones who keep clothes on our backs. We're the ones who buy the groceries. And we will pursue our art, we tell ourselves, when we have enough money to do it easily. And when will that be? We want a God that feels like a fat paycheck and a license to spend as we please. Listening to the siren song of more, we are deaf to the still small voice which is whispering, you're enough. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all things will be added, we have been told. But we don't believe this. And we certainly don't believe it about art. Maybe God would feed and clothe us in a pinch, but painting supplies, a museum tour of Europe, dance classes, God's not about to spring for those, we tell ourselves. We cling to our financial concerns as a way to avoid not only our art, but also our spiritual growth. Our faith is really in the dollar. I have to keep a roof over my head, we say. Nobody's going to pay me to be creative. We are awfully sure about that. Most of us harbor a secret belief that work has to be work and not play, and that anything we really want to do, like write, act, dance, must be considered frivolous and a distant second. This isn't true. We are operating out of a toxic old idea about God, about God's will being at one end of the table and our will being at the other. I want to be an actress, but God wants me to sling hash. Thinking like this is grounded in the idea of God is a stern parent. What would a non-toxic God think of your creative goals? Might such a God really exist? If so, would money or your job remain your higher power? Many of us equate difficulty with virtue and art with fooling around. On the one hand, we give lip service to the notion that God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. On the other, we secretly think that God wants us to be broke if we're going to be so decadent as to be artists. Do we have any proof at all for these ideas? Looking at God's creation, it's pretty clear that the Creator did not know when to stop. There is not one pink flower or even 50 pink flowers, but hundreds. Snowflakes, of course, are the ultimate exercise in creative glee. This creator looks suspiciously like someone who just might send us support for our creative ventures. One of the things that we often do is we decide ahead of time exactly how much support God will give us. We say, I'll never be able to make money doing that. We set the ceiling. We act like it's God's fault that we didn't go to Europe instead of moving out on faith and seeing if the money shows up. One of the things that we need to learn very clearly is that when we become clear in our intention and we take an action, then the support can flow. In Taos, we have an Asakia system, a ditch system, for watering the land and the water cannot flow unless we remove the little gates and this is the process that you're involved in in a creative recovery when you set an intention and lift up the block that says I can't go to Europe because God won't let me you say I'm going to go then the support can come when you're saying, send me the money and then I'll go, it doesn't work. The intention comes first, the money comes second. We have it wired backwards. Now, one of the reasons that I keep talking about wanting you to work in creative clusters is because 
particularly if you are working in a particular art form, you will have ideas about all the ways you can make money in that art form. There's sort of a group consciousness about how painters can get money and how so-and-so can get money and how hard it is to be a writer and what are the odds and you should do this, it's smarter. And if you make a cluster where people do different things, people who are not believing the mythology around your particular art form will give you suggestions that when you think about them, you go, no, we can't do that. And then the light bulb goes on and it says, actually, I could do that. We act like it's God's fault we didn't go to Europe. Take that painting class. Go on that photo shoot. In truth, we are the ones who have decided not to go. We have tried to be sensible as though we have any proof at all that God is sensible, rather than see if the universe might not have supported some healthy extravagance. All too often we become blocked and we blame it on our lack of money. This is not an authentic block. The actual block is our feeling of constriction and our sense of powerlessness. Art requires us to empower ourselves with choice. At its most basic level, this means choosing to do self-care. For those of us who have become artistically anorectic, yearning to feel creative and to act creatively but refusing to feed that hunger, we have become focused on our deprivation. For us, a little bit of authentic luxury can go a long way. Because art is born in expansion and in a belief in sufficient supply, it's critical that we learn how to pamper ourselves because that brings us the sense of abundance that allows us to work on faith. What constitutes pampering is going to vary for each one of us. For me, it's raspberries. When I am feeling really constricted, if I buy raspberries, I think, okay, life is okay. And each of us has to find a little list of touchstones. When you allow yourself to gift yourself in little ways, you begin to believe that the universe will gift you in larger ways. But for us to be able to move into our creativity, we need to be focused on the different choices we have with the amount that we've got. This is from Recovering a Sense of Connection. It's week seven. The ability to listen is a skill we are honing with both our morning pages and our artist dates. The pages train us to hear past our censor, the artist dates help us to pick up the voice of inspiration. While both of these activities are apparently unconnected to the actual act of making art, they are critical to the creative process. Art is not about thinking something up. It is about the opposite, getting something down. The directions are important. If we are trying to think something up, we are straining to grab something that is beyond our grasp. When we get something down, we're not doing, we're getting. Something or someone else is doing the doing. Instead of reaching for inventions, we are engaged in listening. Art is an act of tuning in and dropping down the well. It is as though all the stories, painting, music, performances in the world live just under the surface of our normal consciousness. Like an underground river, they flow through us as a stream of ideas which we can tap into. As artists, we drop down the well and into the stream. We hear what's down there and we act on it. It's more like taking dictation than doing anything fancy. Some people find it easier to picture the stream of inspiration as being like radio waves in the air. All sorts are being broadcast at all times. With practice, we learn how to hear the desired frequency on request. We tune into the frequency when we want it. 
Once you accept the idea that it is natural to create, you can begin to accept a second idea that the creator or the natural world will hand you whatever you need for help with the project. The minute you become willing to accept this collaborator, you will see useful bits of help everywhere in your life. Be alert because there is a second voice, a higher harmonic adding to and augmenting your inner creative voice. This harmonic frequently shows up as synchronicity. You will hear the dialogue you need. You will find the right song for the sequence. You will see the exact paint color you almost had in mind, and so forth. You will have the experience of finding things, books, seminars, tossed out stuff that happens to fit with what you are doing. Learn to accept the possibility that the universe is helping you. Become willing to see the hand of God and accept it as a friend's offer. Because many of us unconsciously harbor the fearful belief that God would find our creations decadent, we tend to discount the visible help as coincidence. Try to remember God is the great artist and that artists like other artists. Jealousy. Jealousy, I have often heard, is a normal human emotion. When I hear that, I think... Maybe your jealousy, not mine. My jealousy roars in the head, tightens the chest, massages my stomach lining while it gets a better grip. I have long regarded jealousy as my greatest weakness. Recently, I have seen it as a tough love friend. Jealousy is a map. Each of our jealousy maps differs. Each of us will probably be surprised by some of the things that we discover on our own. I, for example, have never been eaten alive with resentment over the success of women novelists. But I did take an unhealthy interest in the fortunes of women playwrights. I was their harshest critic until I wrote a play. When I did that, they were transformed from competitors into allies. My jealousy vanished I felt a feeling of camaraderie. My jealousy had actually been a mask for my fear of doing something. It was something I really wanted to do, but I wasn't brave enough to do yet. Jealousy is always a mask for fear. Fear that we aren't able to get what we want. Frustration that somebody else seems to be getting what is rightfully ours even if we're too frightened to reach for it. At its root, jealousy is a stingy emotion. The truth revealed by action in the direction of our dreams is that there is room for all of us. But jealousy produces tunnel vision. It narrows our ability to see things in perspective. It strips us of our ability to see other options. The biggest lie that jealousy tells us is that we have no choice but to be jealous. Perversely, Jealousy strips us of our will to act when action holds the key to our freedom. I'm going to tell you how to make a jealousy map, okay? You take a sheet of paper and you make three columns. In the first column, you number from 1 to 20, and you name everyone you are jealous of, okay? For example, my sister Libby is almost always on my jealousy map. The example in the book is I used to be jealous of Libby because she had a real art studio. So the first thing is who. The second column is what are you actually jealous of them for. The third column is what action can you take in the direction of what they have that you're jealous about. Like, you know, somebody gets a new apartment and you're jealous because they have this great new apartment. Well, the action is be willing to take the action to find yourself a different or better living space. There are some things that we're jealous about that we can't fix, like I'm 5'3", I am not six foot one. I did spend most of my life wanting to be tall and exotic looking. We will hate somebody because 
they're tall and what we really need our action thing is how do we learn to love what we've got okay a jealousy map will break the code for example you make a jealousy map and you officially have absolutely no interest in acting but you have six actors on your list well you want to act I remember uh, when I first did this, I was writing for Rolling Stone, I was terminally hip. My entire stance was, yeah, I can do it too, you guys. You know, sort of chip on your shoulder. The top of my jealousy map was occupied by a woman I knew named Mary. Mary wore pastels, had lots of fluffy blonde hair, wore circle pins, and whenever she got a difficult assignment, burst into tears around the most brilliant male writer she could find and said, would you help me figure this out? I hated her. What I realized when I put her on the map was that I hated her because she knew how to ask for help. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that you're going to race out and, and wear circle pins, but it did allow me to break the code that my total self-sufficiency was not filling my needs creatively or personally. Okay, so you all understand how a jealousy map works. It's a disgusting tool because it really works. Okay, now we're going to take a look at the other besetting evil, perfectionism. We want to do it as long as we can do it perfectly. Tilly Olson correctly calls it the knife of the perfectionist attitude in art. You might call it something else. You might call it getting it right. You might call it fixing it before I go any further. You might call it having standards. What you ought to be calling it is perfectionism. Perfectionism has nothing to do with getting it right. It has nothing to do with fixing things. It has nothing to do with standards. Perfectionism is a refusal to let yourself move ahead. It is a loop. It is an obsessive, debilitating, closed system that causes you to get stuck in the details of what you are writing or painting or making and lose sight of the whole. Instead of creating freely and allowing errors to reveal themselves later as insights, we often get mired in getting the details right. We correct our originality into uniformity that lacks passion and spontaneity. Do not fear mistakes, Miles Davis said. There are none. The perfectionist fixes one line of a poem over and over until no lines of the poem are right. The perfectionist redraws the chin line on a portrait until the paper tears. The perfectionist writes so many versions of scene one that she never gets to the rest of the play. The perfectionist writes, paints, creates with one eye on her audience. Instead of enjoying the process, the perfectionist is constantly grading the result. The perfectionist has married the logic side of the brain. The critic reigns supreme in the perfectionist's creative household. A brilliant descriptive prose passage is critiqued with a white glove approach. Hmm, what about this comma? Is this how you spell? For the perfectionist, there are no warm-up drafts, no rough sketches. For the perfectionist, every draft is meant to be final perfect, set in stone. Midway through a project, the perfectionist decides, I better read it all over and make sure it's going the right direction. Where is it going then? Nowhere very fast. The perfectionist is never satisfied. The perfectionist never says, this is pretty good. I think I'll just keep going. To the perfectionist, there's always room for improvement, and the perfectionist calls this humility. This is not humility. In reality, it is egotism. It is pride that makes us want to write a perfect script, paint a perfect painting, perform a perfect audition monologue. Perfectionism is not a quest for the best. It is the pursuit of the worst in ourselves, the part that tells us that nothing we do will ever be good enough and that we should just try it again. No. We should not. A painting's never finished. It simply stops in interesting places, says Paul Gardner. 
a book's never finished, but at a certain point you stop writing it and you do go on to the next thing. A film is never cut perfectly, but at a certain point you let go and you call it done. That's a normal part of creativity, letting go. We always do, as my friend Nancy says, the best we can by the light we have to see by. What would I do if I didn't have to do it perfectly? The answer is usually a lot more than I am. We have all heard that the unexamined life is not worth living, but consider too that the unlived life is not worth examining. The success of a creative recovery hinges on our ability to move out of the head and into action. I will look like an idiot, we say, conjuring images of our first acting class, our first hobbled short story, our terrible drawings. We deny that in order to do something well, we must first be willing to do it badly. Instead, we opt for setting our limits at the point where we feel assured of success. Living within these bounds, we may feel stifled, smothered, despairing, and bored, but yes, we do feel safe. And safety is a very expensive illusion. In order to risk, we must jettison our accepted limits. We must break through, I can't, because, because I'm too old or too broke or too timorous. What about because I'm too proud, too self-defended? Usually when we say we can't do something, what we mean is that we won't do something unless we can guarantee that we'll do it perfectly. Many artists know the folly of this stance. There's a common joke among directors, oh yeah, I always know exactly how I should direct a picture after I'm done directing it. As blocked artists, we unrealistically expect and demand success from ourselves and recognition of that success from others. With that as an unspoken demand, a great many things remain outside our sphere of possibility. As actors, we allow ourselves to be typecast rather than working to expand our range. As singers, we stay married to our safe material. As songwriters, we try to repeat a formula hit. In this way, many of us who do not appear to the casual eye to be blocked actually experience ourselves internally as blocked because we are unable to take the risk of moving into new and more satisfying artistic territory. In the movie Raging Bull, Jake LaMotta's manager brother explains to him that they ought to shed some weight and do a fight. And he's asked to fight an unknown opponent and the guy gives him an intricate spiel and then he finally says, so do it, if you win you win and if you lose you win. It's that way with taking risks. Very often a risk is worth taking simply for the sake of taking it. There is something enlivening about expanding our self-definition and a risk does that. Selecting a challenge and meeting it creates a sense of self-empowerment that becomes the ground for a further sense of self-empowerment. Recovering a sense of strength. The ivory power. It has been my perilous privilege over the past decade to undertake teaching forays into the groves of academia. It is my experience as a visiting artist that many academics are themselves artistic beings who are deeply frustrated by their inability to create. Skilled in intellectual discourse, Distanced by that intellectual skill from their own creative urgings, they often find the creativity of their charges deeply disturbing. Devoted as they are to the scholarly appreciation of art, most academics find the beast intimidating when viewed firsthand. 
Creative writing programs tend to be regarded with justified suspicion. Those people aren't studying creativity, they're actually practicing it. Who knows where this could lead? I am thinking of a film department chair, a gifted filmmaker who for many years had been unable or unwilling to expose himself to the rigors and the disappointments of creating. Channeling his ferocious creative urges into the lives of his students, he alternately over-controlled and undercut their best endeavors, seeking to vicariously fulfill or justify his own position on the sidelines. As much as I wanted to dislike the man, and I hated his behavior, I hated his behavior, I found myself unable to regard him without compassion. His own thwarted creativity, which was so luminous in his early films, had darkened to shadow first his own life and then the lives of his students. He was in the truest sense a creative monster. I knew that this man was a danger to people, but after I had been teaching longer, I realized that a more subtle foe exists in academia, and it's more soul-chilling, and that's a form of discounting that happens. It's the sort of thing where a student turns in something that is 85% right and all that is discussed is the 15% that is wrong. In many of our academic environments, what we lack is encouragement. Encouragement is the creative nutrient. We learn how to criticize things but we don't learn how to say what's good. We don't have that modeled. Now, in my experience teaching creative writing, if you tell people what's good in their work, they tend to lean into that. If you don't mention what's good and you start telling them what to fix, they never realize that they had all those strengths. So in other words, there's two ways to go at handling a young artist. One is to reinforce what they're doing well and then the bad stuff tends to kind of fall off the edges. They become stronger and more certain. And the other way is the way that we're all taught to do it, which is find the stuff that isn't so good, skip the stuff that's good, focus on the negative. I'm going to make a point here about therapy. Many, many therapists use the artist's way and teach it. And the reason that they do is because what they are discovering is that a lot of people who look neurotic are merely blocked creatively and that what we have been calling deep-seated illness and neurosis is very often our unused creative gift turned in on itself. Having said that, I'm going to go back to academics. Younger artists are seedlings. Their early work resembles thicket and underbrush, even weeds. The halls of academia, with their preference for lofty intellectual theorems, do little to support the life of the forest floor. So if you're in an academic situation where you are savaged, you internalize that doubt, and then when you feel that fear and doubt, you say to yourself, obviously I wasn't really meant to do it anyway, because if I had really been meant to do it, I would be doing it anyway. You know, it's sort of like Darwinian theory applied to creativity, survival of the fittest. So our mythology says, if you haven't done it yet, it's not worth doing and give it up. But my experience says, if you haven't done it yet, you're ripping the rest of us off. Age and time. I am too old to be an actor. I have heard many students complain, and dramatically, I might add. They are not always pleased when I tell them this is not the case. The splendid actor John Mahoney did not begin acting until he was nearly 40. Ten years into a highly successful career, he has often now booked three films in advance. I'm too old to be really a writer is another frequent complaint. This is more ego-saving nonsense. Raymond Chandler did not publish until he was on the far side of 40. 
The superb novel Jules and Jim was written as a first novel by a man in his 70s. I'm too old is an evasive tactic. It is used to avoid facing fear. Now let's look at the other side. I'll let myself try it when I'm retired. This is an interesting side trip on our culture. As a culture, we glorify youth and we allow our youth the freedom to experiment. But we disparage our old timers, yet allow them the right to be a little bit crazy. The rest of us are stuck in the middle. Many blocked creatives tell themselves they are both too old and too young to do what they would wish. Old and dotty, they might try it. Young and foolish, they might try it. In either scenario, being crazy is a prerequisite to creative exploration. We don't want to look crazy, and trying something like that, whatever that is, at our age, whatever that is, would look nuts, maybe. Creativity occurs in the moment, and in the moment we are timeless. As blocked creatives, we like to pretend that a year or even several years is a long, long time. Our ego plays this little trick to keep us from getting started. Instead of allowing ourselves a creative journey, we focus on the length of the trip. Most of the time, the next right thing about our art is something small. Washing out your paintbrushes, stopping by the art supply store and getting your clay, checking the local paper for a list of acting classes. As a rule of thumb, it's best to admit that there usually is at least one small thing you could be doing. Too often, when people look to have a more creative life, they hold an unspoken and often unacknowledged expectation or fear that they'll be abandoning life as they know it. I can't be a writer and stay in this marriage. I can't pursue my painting and stay at this job. I can't commit to acting and stay in Chicago. Blocked creatives like to think they are looking at changing their whole life in one fell swoop. This form of grandiosity is its own undoing. By setting the jumps too high and making the price tag too great, the recovering artist sets defeat in motion. Creative people are dramatic. We use negative drama to scare ourselves out of our creativity. Fantasizing about pursuing our art full time, we fail to pursue it part time or at all. Instead of writing three pages a day on a screenplay, we worry about how we'll have to move to Hollywood. Instead of checking into a life drawing class at the local culture center, we buy art forum and remind ourselves that our stuff is not in style. How can it be? It doesn't exist yet. Instead of clearing off the little room by the kitchen so we can have a place to work on our pottery, we complain that we need a studio. When we indulge in a frantic fantasy of what our life would look like if we were real artists, we fail to see the many tiny creative changes we could make at this very moment. This kind of looking at the big picture thinking ignores the fact that a creative life is grounded on many small steps. Rather than take a scary baby step forward, we rush to the edge of the cliff and say, I can't jump! Nobody's asking you to jump. Creativity requires activity, and this is not good news for most of us. It makes us responsible, and we tend to hate it. We tend to say, you mean I have to do something? Yes, and the something we have to do is small. I'm going to read you Enthusiasm from Week 9, Recovering a Sense of Compassion. I'm gonna make you smile now. Do 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 do
Enthusiasm. It must take so much discipline to be an artist. We are often told by well-meaning people who are not artists but wish that they were. This is a temptation. What a seduction. They're inviting us to preen before an admiring audience to act out the image that's so heroic and so false. As artists, grounding our self-image in military discipline is dangerous. In the short run, discipline may work, but only for a while. The part of us that creates best is not a driven, disciplined automaton functioning from willpower with a booster of pride to back it up. That's operating out of self-will. You know the image rising at dawn to salute the easel. Over any extended period of time, being an artist requires enthusiasm more than discipline. Enthusiasm is not an emotional state. It's a spiritual commitment, a surrender to the creative process. Enthusiasm from the Greek filled with God is an ongoing energy supply tapped into the flow of life itself. Enthusiasm is grounded in play, not work. Remember your artist is a creative child. It sulks, it throws tantrums, it holds grudges, and it harbors irrational fears. Like most children, it is afraid of the dark, the boogeyman, and any adventure that isn't safely scary. As your artist's parent and guardian, its big brother, its warrior, its companion, it falls to you it's to convince your artist that it is safe to come out and play. Beginning any new project, it's a good idea to ask your artist a few simple questions. These questions will help remove the common bugaboos standing between your artist and the work. These same questions asked in the middle of a project when it slows down usually suffice to clear the obstructed flow. Number one, list any resentments or anger you might have in connection with this project. And it does not matter how petty, picky, or irrational the resentments may appear to your adult self. To your artist child, they are very real big deals. Example, I resent being the second artist they ask to work, not the first. I resent this editor. She just nitpicks. I resent working for this idiot. He never pays me on time anyway. Number two. Ask your artist to list any and all fears about the projected piece of work and anybody connected to it. Again, these fears can be dumb as any two-year-olds. What matters is that they are scary monsters to your artist. For example, I'm afraid that the work will be rotten and I won't know it. I'm afraid all my ideas are hackneyed and outdated. On the other hand, I am afraid that my ideas are ahead of their time. I am afraid I will do this work, it'll be great, and nobody will ever publish it anyway. The list goes on, put it all on the page. Third, ask yourself if that is absolutely everything. Have you left out any small fear? Have you suppressed any stupid anger? Put it on the page. Fourth, what do I stand to gain by not doing this. There are terrific payoffs in being a blocked artist. We can sit on the sideline. Francois Truffaut says that critics are blocked directors. He says that because when he was a critic, he was a blocked director, and his criticism was so viperish. And when he let himself make films, his films were so luminous. But there's a real payoff to sitting on the sidelines saying, I could do that better and not trying. One of the lies that we tell ourselves is that it's safer and better to be half-hearted and instead we are breaking our own hearts. For example, if I don't write this piece, nobody can hate it. If I don't write the piece, my jerk editor will get really worried and he'll suffer and stay up all night. If I don't paint or sculpt or act or sing, I can criticize others knowing that I could do it better. 
Now, the last thing you do is you make a deal. And this is the deal. You write it out and you say, okay, creative force, you take care of the quality. I will take care of the quantity. Then you sign that and you post it. I just want to tell you that I have a friend, a screenwriter named Jerry Ayers, and Jerry used to say to me, what you do is you pray for the willingness to write, and then you write. <laughs> right? I thought you prayed for the willingness and then you waited around till you got the willingness. <laughs> This is from week 10, Recovering a Sense of Self-Protection. This essay is called Dangers of the Trail. Creativity is God energy flowing through us, shaped by us like light flowing through a crystal prism. When we are clear about who we are and what we're doing, the energy flows freely and we experience no strain. When we resist what that energy might show us or where it might take us, we often experience a shaky, out-of-control feeling. We want to shut down the flow and regain our sense of control. We slam on the psychic brakes. Every creative person has myriad ways to block creativity. Each of us favors one or two ways particularly toxic to us because they block us so effectively. For some people, food is a creativity issue. Eating sugar or fats or certain carbohydrates may leave them feeling dulled, hungover, and unable to focus. They use food to block energy and change. As the shaky feeling comes over them that they are going too fast and God knows where, that they might be about to fly apart, these people reach for food a big bowl of ice cream, an evening of junk food, and their system clogs. What was I thinking about? Oh, God, well, never mind. For some people, alcohol is the favored block. For others, drugs. For many of us, work is the drug of choice. Busy, busy, busy. We grab for tasks to numb ourselves out. For others, an obsession with painful love replaces creative choice. Reaching for the painful thought, we become instant victims rather than feeling our own considerable power. If only he or she would just love me, we think, instead of working on that short story, rearranging the living room, taking a pottery class. Sex is the great block for many. A mesmerizing, titillating, hypnotic interest slides novel, erotic possibilities in front of the real novel. Now, please note carefully, sex is fine. Food, work, sex, all are good in themselves. It's the abuse of them that make them creativity issues. Knowing yourself as an artist means acknowledging which of these you abuse when you want to block. If creativity is like a burst of the universe's breath through the straw that's each one of us, we pinch that straw whenever we pick up one of our blocks. We shut down our flow, and we do it on purpose. We begin to sense our real potential and the wide range of possibilities open to us. That scares us. It is always fear, often disguised but always there, that leads us into grabbing for a block. The choice to block is a creative U-turn. We turn back on ourselves. The self-honesty lurking in all of us knows when we do it. It marks a little jot on our spiritual blackboard. Did it again. It takes grace to admit and surrender our blocking devices. Who wants to? Not while they're still working. Blocking is essentially an issue of faith. Rather than trust our intuition, our talent, our skill, our desire, we fear where our Creator is taking us. Rather than paint, write, audition, see where it takes us, we pick up a block. Blocked, we know who and what we are. We are unhappy people. Unblocked, we may be something much more threatening. Unfamiliar, out of control, 
too risky, happy.